Good morning and welcome to the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. My name is Nat Silver and I'm the curator of the collection. Now, in a year's time, it'll, it's here at the museum in Boston that we're going to reunite for the first time in the United States, Titian's Poesie. This is a life-changing event, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and we encourage you to come to this exhibition. Now, what are Titian's poesie? Well, Titian painted between 1551 and 1562 a cycle of mythological paintings. There were six paintings, and he made them for the most powerful man in Europe, King Philip II of Spain. All of these paintings, all six paintings, depicted scenes in which gods come into contact with humans and the kind of fireworks that ensue from these moments. They're pictures of lust and tragedy and sometimes of death. In this case, we have here at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum the last of those series of six paintings. So this is The Rape of Europa, and it's the sixth painting in this cycle. This is a cycle that's not just important for the painter Titian, but a cycle that transformed Western European art painting from Velazquez to Manet and beyond. So we want to talk a little bit about this painting here at the Garden, The Rape of Europa. Now where does this story come from? The story comes from an ancient poet named Ovid, and the story goes as follows. Jupiter, the king of the gods, was lusting after the young noblewoman named Europa. Now, he knew that Europa was outside with some of her maidens in a field picking flowers, and he had a herd of cattle driven down a mountain towards them and transformed himself into one of these cows so that he could get as close as he possibly could um, to the object of his desire, to Europa. Now, what you're looking at here in Titian's painting in the very background is just that. You see a mountain range in the distance, and you see a herd of cattle at the far left-hand side of the painting on the shore. If you look really carefully, you can see there's one pale-colored cow right there. Now, what happened? Well, as soon as Europa saw Jupiter as a cow, as a bull, she got as close as she possibly could because he was the most beautiful one of the bunch, and she wove uh, a crown of flowers and put it on his head. Now, as, she, as soon as she got close enough to put it on his head, he swept her off her feet and carried her off across the sea. And that's exactly what you see here. Titian focuses on the most dramatic moment of this story, the moment of her kidnap and her abduction. So this is the moment right before her rape. That's his intention. And these are stories like the Rape of Europa that have momentous consequences for Western European history. So it's the child produced by their union that goes on to become the ruler of Crete, the founder of Europe. And so that's the story behind this painting. Now you can see that Titian looked up to, to translations of Ovid in all of the details. Now if we get up close to the painting, you can see here that the bull is wearing the crown of flowers that lured Europa close to him and allowed him to carry her off across the sea. Now, of course, this is a kidnap, an abduction, so you can actually read the terror on Europa's face if you look carefully at the whites of her eyes there just underneath her forearm. And of course, being kidnapped, she waves this red scarf towards her friends on the shore who wave back in terror. She's trying to get their attention, to call out, to say, help me. Now, Titian conveys this sense of panic and this sense of terror not just through her face and through her actions, but in the very way, in the very posture that she takes on the back of the bull Jupiter himself. You can see that it's an incredibly precarious position, which speaks to the precarious nature of her situation and the impending rape that's about to take place when they make landfall just beyond this painting. You can see that here she's balanced on the back of the bull, her legs are spread wide open, and perhaps if she were to slip off, she'd slip into the water and drown, or maybe even be eaten by a sea monster who's conjured here in the form of this, this terrifying-looking scaly fish with tiny teeth. Now, 
At the same time that we see the terror on her face and the precariousness of her position, we can also sense this very strange element of humor. Now, humor was an element of the story which Ovid himself wrote into it, the, the, in, in, even in the fact that the idea that the king of the gods would transform himself into a farmyard animal like a bull and after go, to go after the object of his desire was something that his readers found very funny, despite the horror of this story. Now, Titian really buys into that, and he has the bull look at us with these almost innocent eyes as if to suggest, who me? He conveys that, that little bit of humor in other ways as well. While Europa cries out in terror for her friends and is totally vulnerable, Titian paints in this tiny Cupid in the foreground. This Cupid is riding a dolphin after Europa in the same way that Europa appears to be riding the bull. And if you look closely at the pose of this Cupid, he appears to be mimicking or imitating or making fun of Europa's own position in this very precarious um, pose. Now, Isabella Stewart Gardner bought this painting in 1896, bringing it to Boston, one of the greatest Renaissance artworks in the United States. When it got here, it was a huge success. People fell at their feet to come and see this painting in her house, and it eventually became a cornerstone of her new museum, which opened in 1903. The cornerstone of this room, which she actually named the Titian Room after the painter who made this. But its purchase wasn't always a foregone conclusion. In 1896, her agent, Bernard Berenson, had actually offered her a different painting first, not the Titian, but Thomas Gainsborough's Blue Boy. He offered it to her for a huge sum of money, for 30,000 pounds. Gardner, who was at the time considering it and seemed to be willing to go for this painting, was very excited about it, was suddenly devastated when the owner of the painting in England withdrew it from sale. Now, her very crafty and clever art advisor, Berenson, knew that she was clearly willing to spend a lot of money on a painting, even though this other opportunity had disappeared. He realized that there was a Titian on the market which absolutely aligned with her taste in Renaissance art. He had already offered it to one of her Boston competitors named Susan Warren, but he had failed to send Mrs. Warren a photograph of the painting, so she hadn't yet decided. He quickly changed his mind, sent a photograph to Isabella Stewart Gardner, she agreed on the spot, and the painting was sent to Boston several months later, becoming what would be the most famous Renaissance painting in the United States. Now, when she moved it here to her museum, she created an installation around it that encourages us to look at some of those wonderful details that we were just talking about a second ago. So if you remember, I was pointing out this little Cupid in the foreground, next to which Titian's signature appears. You can actually see his inscription, Titianus P, for Titian painted it. And below that Cupid, on a table, Gardner installed this Cupid. Now this is a 17th century French bronze, nothing to do with the Renaissance Italian painting above it. And it originally would have stood vertically on this ball so that the Cupid was standing up blowing a horn. Gardner chose this idiosyncratic lying down position deliberately because it corresponds to the pose of the Cupid in Titian's painting above. And it encourages you to look at this detail as well as, of course, to notice the signature in the bottom left-hand corner, so the fact that she was very proud that this painting was by Titian. Now, on the table next to it, opposite in the other corner, she shows us several other works of the Rape of Europa. So here is a drawing, a, a copy after the famous painting. <clears throat> and then in front of that drawing, there's a tiny bronze relief. And that's the story of the Rape of Europa, but by an American artist, an American artist she knew named Paul Manship. So this is one of the ways that Gardner built a kind of um, a sense of looking into the museum and a sense of the continuity of the history of art from the past to the present in all of its different forms. Now, one of the things that we were most excited about and one of the reasons why um, the, the, uh, 
this exhibition is very special for us because is because it gave us an opportunity to clean our painting. Now, of the six paintings of Poesie, ours is the only one that's just been cleaned. As far as we can tell, it hadn't been cleaned since Gardner bought it, and over the course of more than 100 years, of course, the surface of the painting had gotten very dirty. So what we're seeing here is the newly cleaned painting in a new light, and you will be able to see it when you get up close to it in the exhibition gallery. Now, I encourage you to take this opportunity in the next few weeks to look at the Rape of Europa here at home in the Titian Room, because on February 10th, our painting will be going on tour for the beginning of this exhibition, first in London, then in Edinburgh, Scotland, and finally in Madrid, before it returns to us here in Boston in February of 2021, when you all have to come and see this fantastic exhibition here with us. Now, thank you all for tuning in today, and we encourage you to come and see Titian's Rape of Europa.